Today we have uh, Ed, Ed Clopton from the Maine Mineralogical and Geological Society talking about uh, Georgia's Agricola and Dairy Metallica. Uh, Ed, thank you for being here. And whenever you're ready, uh, we can start your presentation. Okay. Well, thanks for having me. And good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening, or whatever applies in whatever time zone you're in. Um, so Georgius Agricola is not exactly a household name among mineral collectors or geologists or metallurgists, but probably should be. This 16th century German physician was fascinated with rocks and ores and mining and metal refining. In his, in his spare time uh, away from his professional duties and his uh, family obligations, and he also had some civic duties later in life, he, he uh, set out to learn everything he could about the subject by visiting mines. He hung out around mills and smelters. He sought out the most knowledgeable people in the industry that he could find and picked their brains and learned as much as he could. And to his great ever redounding credit, he uh, wrote down and published what he learned. Uh, he published several uh, books and publications and pamphlets, and one massive, magnificent book called De Re Metallica, or All About Metals. That book uh, quickly became Europe and the New World's go-to reference on the subject of mining and smelting and refining and all the related subjects for almost 200 years. And in the process of doing all this work, he also did some original thinking of his own and ended up making some significant contributions to mineralogy and metallurgy and geology that deserve to be better remembered. Some people argue that he was, in fact, the first mineralogist in the, the modern tradition. So let's get to know Georgius Agricola and Dere Metallica a little better. This is Germany. And this little box here outlines the Erzgebirge or Ore Mountains, which now form the border between Germany and the Czech Republic. Now, Georg Bauer was born in the town of Glaukau in now Saxony. And he went to school at the University of Leipzig, which is just off the map up here. He came back and taught school for a short time in Glaukau, in his hometown. Then he went off to medical school in Italy. So who is Georg Bauer and what does he have to do with Georgius Agricola? Well, at that time in the, in the 16th century, it was fashionable for academically oriented people to go by the Latin versions of their, the name in whatever their native language is. So Bauer in German means farmer in English and Agricola went to Italy as Georg Bauer and came back as Georgius Agricola and used that name for the rest of his life. He started his professional life in the town of St. Joachimstal, which is now Yakimov in the Czech Republic. He was town physician there for a few years. Then he uh, settled in Chemnitz and was the town physician there for the rest of his life and the rest of his career. So what was going on in Agricola's lifetime? Well, he was born in 1494, and at that time, uh, Christopher Columbus was in the middle of his second voyage to what he still thought was the, the East Indies. Um, Henry VIII was, or excuse me, Henry VII was the King of England, and in another 15 years, his, his little toddler son at the age of 18 would become Henry VIII. I don't know which is scarier, a three-year-old Henry VIII or an 18-year-old Henry VIII, but neither one's a very appealing idea. At any rate, Cortez entered Mexico in 1519 while Agricola was a young man. In 1520, Cortez, excuse me, uh, Magellan sailed around Cape Horn. So during Agricola's adulthood, the Spanish and Portuguese conquests in the New World, that's what was happening. And I suspect, I haven't read about this, but I suspect that the influence of all that new world silver into Europe put some pressure on the German mining industry to keep up. 
Um, also, in this at this time, um, printing with movable type had only been going on for you know more than fifth, less than fifty years, and so the printed word was becoming widespread for the first time ever. Books were the new thing, like the internet today. The printing with movable type was revolutionizing the way knowledge and ideas got spread around. So what didn't we know during Agricola's lifetime? He died in 1555. Um, that was nine years before the births of Shakespeare and Galileo, who both were born in 1564. Um, he died 75 years before William Harvey demonstrated that blood circulates through the body. What Agricola learned in medical school in Italy in uh, probably 1520 would have been based largely on the writings of Galen from the second century AD. He knew, I mean, everybody knew that you have a heart and everybody knows you have blood. And we know it must be pretty important because if you lose enough of it, you die. But exactly what it did and how and why were, were still pretty mysterious to people. Grickel had died a century and a half or two centuries before the first steam engines were built. So the power to do things came entirely from muscles, either humans or animals, from water power, water wheels, or windmills. He died more than 200 years before we started to investigate the, and organize the material world in terms of atoms and molecules and compounds and that sort of thing. That waited, that didn't come about till uh, people like Lavoisier and Dalton and Priestley and Berzelius and all those folks started setting up what we think of as modern chemistry. And Agricola knew that there were pure substances and that there were mixtures, but he or nobody else really understood how and why they interact the way they do. He also died about 140 years before the Salem witchcraft trials in Massachusetts. Now, that particular connection is not real relevant, but it's a, a reminder that ideas that we regard today as being no cold or supernatural were just valid, matter of fact explanations for a lot of phenomena in the 16th century. And one example is that while Agricola is in, in De Re Metallica, while he's discussing why mine workings might be abandoned and why entrepreneurs should perhaps think twice before trying to reactivate abandoned mine workings. He lists various reasons. Um, could be the ore ran out. It could be because there's unmanageable water flow. You can't keep the thing pumped out so you can work. Maybe there's persistent warfare in the neighborhood and security is a problem. Or maybe there are fierce and murderous demons present in the mine. So that's just one more reason why you, you want to think twice about reactivating old mine workings. Now, to get a feel for the underground world that Agricola knew, um, we have some photographs that were generously shared by a couple of MINDAP members, uh, Christian Auer of Australia and Gerhard Braunstetter of Germany. And we see them first in their natural lighting, but that helps to turn on a light. Here we're looking straight up a shaft. These are 16th century excavations that were dug during Agricola's lifetime. And um, it's, I suppose it's possible that he even visited some of them himself. In 1549, Agricola wrote a, or published a little booklet called De Animatibus Subterraneus, or about underground creatures. And it included a section about the gnomes that live in mines. So quoting, he said, there are the gentle kind which the Germans as well as the Greeks called kobalos because they mimic men. They appear to laugh with glee and pretend to do much, but they really do nothing. They are called little miners because of their dwarfish stature, which is about two feet. They are venerable looking and are clothed like miners. This kind does not often trouble the miners. Sometimes they throw pebbles at the workmen but they rarely injure them unless the workmen first ridicule or curse them. They are not unlike goblins, which occasionally appear to men when they go to or from their day's work or when they attend to cattle. The mining gnomes are especially active in workings where metal has already been found 
or where there are valid hopes of discovering metal. They do not discourage the miners, but on the contrary, their presence motivates the miners to labor all the more vigorously. So the elements that we know as cobalt and nickel owe their names to the fact that they were first isolated in the 1700s from normal looking ores that in Agricola's time resisted processing by the usual means and were assumed to be under some sort of spell cast by the kobolds we just met or by nickel, who was, that's the name of another gnome that lived in German mines. Um, here is my own little piece of what looks like kupferkies, which we, we now call chalcopyrite. It's got that brassy look to it. It even has some kind of greenish tarnish on it. Aber, but, wir kennen heraus kein Kupferschmelten. We can't smelt any copper out of this. Warum? Why? Nun, scheinbar es ist Kupfer nickel. It, apparently, it's the goblin's copper. Copper that's under the spell of the goblins. There's thus by the kobolds bezaubertist. It's a word that the kobolds have bewitched. So there you are. If we uh, look at the edge of it here, there's not only some greenish tarnish, but there's some pinkish coloration, which we know to be cobalt. So this piece of rock contains both of the German goblin elements. The underground environment. The new is dark and silent, it's damp, the air is stale, rocks can fall and kill you, and there are these little guys two feet tall living down there that you have to be nice to. Now, this guy is, he's not a German kobold, he's a Cornish Tommy knocker, who's, they're, they're at least related, so they, they probably they might even know one another down underground, who knows. So, Agricola made four main contributions to the fields of, to the field of geology and so on. Um, one was in assaying. Um, there was contributions in descriptive mineralogy, in the origin of ore veins, and his book, De Re Metallica. So on assaying, that of course is the practice of testing samples of ore to see how much metal it contains, and to determine whether it's worth the trouble and expense of mining it and processing. Now, assaying has been around for hundreds or thousands of years, and, but the technical knowledge um, up until Agricola's time had been transmitted just as oral history, you know, from one master to apprentice down the line, or sometimes in the form of manuscripts, but there was no published reference knowledge about it. There was one little book, uh, Probierbüchlein, which basically means testing booklet from the 1520s. But it was just a, a, a compilation of recipes kind of for reference by somebody who already knew what he was doing. Uh, there, was, there was nowhere somebody could go just on his own to learn about assaying until Agricola published De Re Metallica. And um, with time and effort, anybody could read that book and with some practice learned to assay ores of all of the important metals of Central Europe. And that's the first time that kind of resource had ever been available. For descriptive mineralogy, or what we now call descriptive mineralogy, um, in a booklet called De Natura Fossilium, or on the nature of things dug out of the ground, Agricola presented descriptions of about a hundred distinct rocks and minerals. Now, there's a lot of ambiguity, a lot of overlap between the things that he talks about, but there are a lot of them that can still be recognized as rocks and minerals that we deal with today. And it's not bad, not a bad effort for coming 200 years before we started to understand minerals in terms of elements and compounds and that sort of thing. And what's really remarkable about it is that this was the first new contribution to what, again, what we call descriptive mineralogy today since um, Pliny the Elder, who died in the eruption of Vesuvius in 79 AD. So ever since Pliny's time, um, scholars had just been repeating what Pliny wrote. Nobody had really bothered to review it, revise it, add to it, flesh it out, 
They just kept repeating it until Agricola came along and published some brand new descriptions and new materials. And even given the work that Agricola did, he also kind of fretted at one point that there's a lot more things that don't have names that, that I know about and I just haven't gotten to them yet. Now on the origin of ore veins, um, if Agricola had taken a course in economic geology in the 1500s, if there had been such a thing, this is what he would have learned about where ores and metal come from. This is paraphrased from something called the Bergbüchlein, uh, the mountain booklet or mining booklet that was circulating in the early 1500s. This book says that whenever materials are transformed in nature, there is a material that is being worked on and an efficient force working upon it. The efficient force on ores and indeed on all things is the heavens multiplied by the movements of the firmaments and the seven planets. The common materials of all metals are quicksilver and sulfur, which are united into metallic bodies under the efficient force of the heavens and the planets. Every metal receives a special influence from its own particular planet. Gold by the sun, silver by the moon, Jupiter by cop, excuse me, tin by Jupiter, copper by Venus, iron from Mars, lead by Saturn, and quicksilver by Mercury. Some authorities believe that various exhalations and condensations are drawn from the earth and are fixed in place in the veins by the planets. Not everyone believes that quicksilver is always involved but that instead a damp and cold and slimy material is drawn up from the earth and combined with sulfur to form metals. There you have the state of the art of uh, mineralogy or mineralogy in the 1500s. Now the, uh, this damp, cold, slimy business is not merely descriptive. Those are references to the classical four elements that um, have been, had been around since you know, for a couple thousand years by that time. Um, each of the four elements has two attributes. It's either hot or cold, and it's either dry or wet. And so by describing the, whatever materials he's talking about as being cold and damp, um, he is, the, the writer there is associating them with one of the four classical elements. So Agricola wasn't satisfied with that kind of explanation. He uh, went to the source, he looked at the rocks, he went into mines and looked at the veins in situ, he looked at how veins were uh, distributed over the lay of the land and so forth. He made his observations and he drew a couple of new conclusions that took a couple hundred years for the natural philosophers or what we now call scientists to catch up to. First of all, he Excuse me. He suggested that ore veins are younger than the surrounding rock. It didn't all come to being simultaneously. But the ore veins were somehow deposited later. And second, he suggested that the ore veins consist of what he called solidified juices. It's a strange sounding term, but when we think about the hydrothermal processes that we talk about now for depositing minerals and veins, the water with materials dissolved in them, seeping into cracks and, and depositing them there. Solidified juices is not a bad summary of it. So those were two pretty new ideas that the ore veins were younger than the surrounding rock and that they were somehow deposited by fluids. This empirical approach that he took is significant. Um, alchemy and natural philosophy at that time existed pretty much on an equal basis. Nobody knew which um, avenue of inquiry would lead to useful answers. There's a minor scandal every so often when someone points out that Isaac Newton, that paragon of science and physics and all that, was also an avid, devout alchemist. At that time, nobody didn't Nobody knew yet which kind of inquiry was going to lead to, you know, get, kind of get to the bottom of things. And they, at that time, they both showed some promise. And for an intellectual like Newton, it would have been irresponsible of him to ignore 
you know, some potentially promising avenue of inquiry like alchemy. <laughs> um, Agricola didn't trust alchemy. He said there's no record. He said the alchemists are completely dead serious about their claims, but no one, no alchemist is ever known to have become wealthy by manufacturing gold or silver. And he thinks that renders their claims kind of dubious. So um, he went with the more empirical approach of the natural philosophers. He wrote that I have omitted all those things which I have not myself seen or have not read or heard others on whom I can rely. That which I have neither seen nor carefully considered after reading or hearing of, I have not written about. That sounds reasonable enough today to you and me, but in the 1500s, that represented a radical independence of thought. At that time, you were supposed to just look up what the ancient authorities had said and quote it and leave it at that. Agricola was a pioneer, maybe the pioneer, in, uh, in relying on direct observation of nature and drawing conclusions from that rather than the purely mental exercise of philosophical speculation to establish what we now think of as the facts of science. And he probably deserves to be a little better known about it than he is. And uh, the final contribution is his book, De Re Metallica, which is what will occupy kind of the rest of, the rest of our time here. The title means more or less all about metals. And it's a, comp a compendium, excuse me, of all that was known about mining and refining and all the supporting activities like surveying and assaying and um, producing your, um, your materials, like your, your chemical reagents, you even had chapters on making glass because if you need glassware for making acids, you can't just order them up from Granger's. You've got to you know, make your own glass, blow your vessels and do it that way. So we covered that. There's all about all the different kinds of machinery, all the many, many types of furnaces that you're going to use, bellows for running blast furnaces, bellows and things for ventilating mines and so on. It's all in this book. Um, it became standard reference on mining in Europe and the New World for about 200 years. Um, some communities are said to have chained their copy of the book to the altar in the church, partly for safekeeping and partly to keep it handy so the priest who was schooled in Latin could translate the content for the local miners or engineers who are wanting to consult it. Agricola wrote in Latin, uh, probably primarily to make the book more broadly accessible than it would be if it had been written in a national language like his native German. But he was also trained in the classics and was a, a great enthusiast for the, for the classics. He loved uh, Greek and Latin languages and he had great respect for the classical authorities. And so it's um, argued that he wrote, from, wrote in Latin partly for practical reasons and partly because he wanted to do important work in an important language. The Latin presented a problem, however. Um, he wrote, the, these things dealt with in this art of metals sometimes lack names, either because they're new or because the record of names by which they were formerly known is lost. For this reason, I have been forced to describe them by a number of words combined or to distinguish others by new names. And if anyone does not approve of these names, let him either find better ones or discover the words that were used in the writings of the ancients. In other words, I'm doing the best I can here but we're breaking new ground. The book was translated immediately into Italian and German. It was, Italian, it was done pretty poorly. Um, at that time, of course, there were no intellectual property protections. So anybody was free to you know, make use of whatever was published. And so it, it was published pretty promptly in Italian and German, and it even made it into Chinese in the 1600s, which is an interesting story in itself. But for whatever reason, the book never made it into English. By the 19th century, uh, it would have been of historical interest to English you know, engineers and historians and so on. 
but um, Agricola's Latin was a problem. The Latin scholars didn't know about, didn't have the technical background to make sense of the technical content and the improvised vocabulary. And the engineers who knew the technical side of things and would have been interested in that part of it no longer routinely learned Latin in school. And so nobody could make head or tail of it, in at least in England, for a long time. And so there the book sat until 1907, when a well-heeled American with a background in both geology and languages stumbled onto it and decided to prepare an English translation. Well, this is Lou Henry. Um, she was the first woman to uh, to major in geology at Stanford University. And she was the first woman in the whole country to graduate with a degree in geology. And incidentally, she um, was born and raised in Waterloo, Iowa, which is where I'm from. Um, right nearby, I lived in Waterloo my first, first few years of life. She's better known by her married name. Um, while at Stanford, she met a guy named Herbert Hoover who was another engineer. He was studying engineering. She was studying geology. They met and hit it off and married. Um, Herbert set out into the professional world and very shortly made a fortune as a consulting engineer, um, re-engineering re mines um, all over the world for a consulting firm in England. He eventually left that firm and they settled in London. He was starting to, you know, operate his own little mining empire from London. He was one of the, one of the wealthiest Americans around at that time. Um, the Hoovers um, both became kind of intrigued with this project and they worked on it together. They also determined to do it right. They, um, for one thing, assembled a whole reference library of sources to help them do things like make sense of the antique weights and measures and old mining law and some of the geography of where all he was. Um, that library has been preserved intact at um, the Claremont Colleges in California. And so it, their, their reference library still, still exists as, as they assembled it. They hired research assistants. Um, a lot of the word for word translation was done by assistants and then the Hoovers took that and kind of banged it into shape and figured out exactly what it meant. They even did some lab work to work out um, some of the procedures in the assaying chapters and figure out what some of these obscure reagents were that he was referring to. And they did a very good job. As, as I recall, there's only one spot where there's a footnote that says, um, you know, we confess that we have no idea what this what this reagent is, what this substance is he's talking about. But everything else they worked out, they, they made it work, and they put a lot of effort into it. So they, they ended up with something that was not just a word-for-word -word translation of the original text. It's a scholarly, well-researched um, effort. It's full of footnotes. Some of the footnotes themselves go on for pages. They're practically chapters in themselves that give you know, the history of mining law, um, analysis of weights and measures, summaries of Agricola's writings on other subjects like you know, rock and mineral types and so on. Uh, so it's, a, it's quite, a, quite, a, uh, quite a project, quite an undertaking, and quite a publication. It was published by the Mining Magazine in 19... And it was um, published far below the cost of publication. Um, they said the one guinea, which is a pound and a shilling in English, in England, um, it was only one fifth of the cost of production. But they printed it on archival paper. It was expensively bound, and it's even the, the Hoover edition of De Re Metallica is a major collector's item among bibliophiles today. The Hoover's. Uh, contemplated taking on some other um, pub, uh, translation projects, but you note the date here, 1912, uh, World War One broke out in Europe about that time. And the Hoovers became involved, first of all, in helping Americans who were stranded in Europe get back to the US. And secondly, they um, took on the task of providing food to the entire civilian population of Belgium, which was occupied by Germany, was under naval blockade and cut off from its usual sources of food. 
So the Hoovers were two of the wealthiest and best connected Americans in Europe, and they were well positioned to take on these, these projects. They also served um, to help Herbert make the transition from engineering industry to public service, which is something he'd kind of been thinking about anyway. He, uh, after the war, he came back to the U.S. and became Secretary of Commerce and eventually President of, of the U.S. So um, Dere Metallica is still in print today. Hoover edition is in print as a Dover paperback. This is my copy of it. You can see that it has a lot of miles on it, got a lot of wear and tear. It's um, worth, worth looking through. It's The book is um, fairly readily available and is very readable. It more or less speaks for itself. So you'll, you'll be pleased to know that I will not lead you through it chapter by chapter and summarize all the contents. But I will uh, make observations about you know, some of the highlights of it. First of all are the illustrations. The book is illustrated with 300 woodcuts. Now that is a lot of illustrations even for a, a book of the 19th century, let alone of the 16th century. It's one of the first heavily illustrated printed books and the reason it occupies a, a notable place in the history of publishing as well as in the history of mining and metallurgy. Agricola understood the value of good illustrations. He wrote in the introduction that I have not only described the things of which I write, but have also hired illustrators to delineate their forms. Less descriptions which are conveyed by words should either not be understood by men of our own times or should cause difficulty to posterity in the same way as to us difficulty is often caused by many names which the ancients, because such words were familiar to all of them, have handed down to us without any explanation. So he's looking ahead, knows that a picture is worth a thousand words, and to great expense and trouble to produce a wonderfully illustrated volume. A lot of the illustrations look kind of naive to us because of their distorted perspective. The mathematical perspective um, had only been developed, actually it had been known in classical times, ancient times, but it had been forgotten how to do it. And Italian artists in the 15th century had kind of reconstructed how to do math mathematical perspective in, in drawings. But that hadn't made its way to Northern Europe yet for you know, for the most part. Some people like uh, Matthias Grunewald and Albrecht Dürer were, were using it in their fine art work, but for routine illustration, like books about mining, artists doing that hadn't learned yet how to do the mathematical perspective. But the illustrations are still pretty sophisticated. You know, this one illustrates salt wells and um, how, how brine is drawn up out of the wells to be taken and, and boiled down to make salt. And one, of, one feature of a lot of the drawings is that uh, the details in the pictures are keyed with letters to the caption. So the M here and here, if we look back down at the caption, we see that those are the forked sticks on which the porters rest their poles when they become tired. So he includes a lot of human details in the pictures as well as the technical content. The illustrator who designed the illustrations, a guy named Blasius Veffring, uh, tended to use two methods to pack maximum detail into one frame. One of them we see here on the left, you will show um, parts of, of, of a machine or something scattered apparently casually, but as you look, they're very informatively scattered out on the ground so you can see exactly what's going on. Here, um, we're looking at suction pumps. And um, up here's a guy boring out a log to make one of the pipes. And coincidentally, beside him are a couple of the tools he's using the bore with. Um, here are some finished pipes. Here are all the parts of the flap valve at the bottom of the, of the piston that helps draw the water up out. And they're all, all the pieces are lying there and they're keyed to the illustration. It's also described verbally in the text. 
Here we see uh, male and female parts of a coupling where two pipes are joined end to end. So at first glance, it looks kind of cluttered and busy, but there's a lot of useful information in a lot of these illustrations. The other technique that um, he uses to um, get a lot of information into one frame is to show several different means of doing the same thing going on at once. Now in practice, probably only one of these methods would be used in any one place at one time. But here we have several different ways of descending down into a mine. This guy's being lowered down on a rope by windlass. He's got his lamp lit so we can see what he's doing. This guy is climbing down on a ladder. This guy is sliding down a smooth surface and he's got a, his arm around a rope to control speed as he goes down so he doesn't crash into something. And these folks are just walking down steps down into the mine. And here's a guy leading the horse um, probably back up to the surface. The people in the pictures are very human. They've got faces, they've got expressions, they're doing things. Nobody is just standing there like a department store dummy. They, they all have functions and so on. This guy, th this picture illustrates a fire setting, which was used to uh, weaken the rock underground um, to make it more brittle and fracture it so it could be dug more easily. This guy is uh, using a schnitzel bunk, which clamps down a piece of wood with his foot pedal here. And he's using a draw knife to shave up shavings on the surface of the stick. That helps it catch fire more readily, more reliably. In a fireplace or something on the surface, you can stand there and tend the fire and manage it and make sure it burns. Down here in a confined space underground, you're not going to do that. You're going to light it and split because the heat and the smoke will drive you out or kill you, one or the other. This guy has lit the fire down here, and he's already being affected by the fumes, and he's on his way out. Um, Agricola says that you uh, set your fire on Thursday or Friday, clear out for the weekend, and by Monday, the fire should be out, and enough of the smoke should have cleared that you can get in and, and go back to work. I was astonished to learn that this method of fire setting was still being used as late as the like the second quarter of the 19th century, like the mid 1800s in the Kongsberg silver mine in Germany, uh, in Norway, excuse me, Norway. I figured that would have died out long before, but they were they were still using it 200 years ago, which is amazing. Here's another example of um, several different ways of doing the same thing. These are sluices for capturing either um, stream tin, you know, particles of cassiterite or gold. So you have what you need is a rough surface. So the little particles will be caught while the water and the lighter materials wash away. So here, um, this one just has planks that have rough shavings left on the surface to trap the materials. Here you have a board with diagonal grooves carved in it. It's another one that'll trap the little particles. This one has um, skin of oxen on it with the hair still on it. The hair catches the small particles. And here you have a plank with little pockets chiseled into it, which is what this guy's doing. And these guys are having lunch. That's, that's, gotta, that's gotta be done too. On the right, uh, we have a, a glass furnace. We, we talked about making the glass vessels for producing your acids and alcohol and whatever else you need for reagents. So you have a glass furnace, you have all the different stages of glass blowing here, pulling out a gather, shaping it, blowing it, um, and so forth. Um, back here, I, I assume that's a tavern. It looks like people are having a drink. This guy is reckoning up some figures and probably in dust or sand on the on the surface of the bench. There's some broken glassware that probably will get recycled, thrown back in the furnace. And here's a woman taking care of a child right in the middle of all of it. This is one of my favorite illustrations um, showing um, cobbing of high grade silver ore. Um, they, they would hammer it by hand and separate out just the, the, uh, the bits of the high grade ore, separate them and throw the, the waste rock, throw the waste rock away. But there are situations in which it's practical to do this manually. Got a couple of people working away at that. 
And here's a little kid sitting on the floor with his toy hammer, playing with a dog and so forth. Some of the details in these pictures are, are really astonishing. Um, here up in the woods, there's a, a woodman carving a, a beam. It's a, a timber to be used in the mine, probably, um, bringing a cart of ore out. You see a lot of broken trees, there's gullies, um, the worn land. A lot of these pictures show really distressed landscape. The, there's a lot of wear and tear on the environment from mining even 500 years ago. Um, I think this is uh, washing alluvial tin again. And it's not all work and no play. If we look down in the corner, we can see the window. So the illustrations in this book are a blast, and they are what kind of drew me into it in the first place. There was one surprising thing turned up in the section on surveying, That's something I didn't see coming at all. Now, this is a pretty straightforward surveying situation. Uh, we have a, an existing shaft. They're driving an adit horizontally in to intersect the shaft, and the owner wants to know how much farther we have to go. How long is it going to take? How many men do I have to hire? How much is it going to cost me? How far do we have to go yet before we hit the shaft? So the surveyor um, hangs a plumb line down, down the shaft, and you can measure the length of that. You can just tell when it touches the bottom, and you can pull it up and measure how long that was. You stretch another line from that same point down to the mouth of the adit, and you can measure that line. But what counts is you hang this down here and you make a horizontal connection there. You can measure this distance and take that proportion to the whole depth of the shaft and use that same proportion um, with the distance from here to here. You can determine how far you've gone, how much farther you have to go. And that's just arithmetic. There's no trigonometry involved in doing that. But there were some complex surveying situations that you couldn't, where you couldn't get away with this. They really weren't doing trigonometry yet with sines and cosines and tangents and all that. So they would take their measurements and then go out to a flat level open field and reconstruct the survey at full scale and then measure whatever missing distances or angles or whatever they were after. And I never expected that to be done, the idea of reconstructing a survey at full scale. But that was something that sometimes had to be done because they didn't yet have the mathematics to handle or they had lost mathematics and may have been known in antiquity. Um, but at, at any rate, that was the only way they could solve some of these problems. I mentioned that things were, the power to do things came from either muscles. Um, here we have um, a couple of goats running a treadmill that turns this millstone here. This is for fine milling of, of ore, getting it down to a powder, powder like consistency. Here you have two men doing the same thing. They have a, a stationary bar and they're pushing this tread wheel with their feet, which turns this shaft, which turns this millstone up here. And we might have noticed um, up in the top of this illustration, there's, there's a windmill that off in the distance that uh, might be doing grain, it might be ventilating a mine, it might be running a mill, it's hard to tell. In this illustration, we have um, a, a pump. This is a, called a rag and chain pump. The, the chain with the balls that are about the same diameter as the interior of the pipe are pulled up through the pipe and they pull the water up with them. And that is driven by horses that are harnessed to this, um, it's called a whim, that turns around this shaft and it runs that machine. Uh, there happens to be a double tree lying here, so it looks like it was done to be, it was designed to be run by four pairs of horses. There are a lot of dogs show up in the pictures too. He, he does, the illustrator um, apparently like to illustrate dogs. Here we have three different ways of running bellows for ventilating a mine. This is a, another horse swim where a horse is going in circles around a vertical shaft and driving these bellows. Here's a horse that's standing still, but he's been trained to, with his, with his forefeet, to turn this tread wheel here, which runs bellows back in this enclosure. 
And this guy is working down in the mine and has foot pedals that are driving these bellows. And these are suction bellows. They're pulling the bad air out and ventilating it here. And for his sake, we hope that they're fairly near the surface that it's ventilated uh, pretty well. This guy down here apparently is testing airflow. He's got a smoldering um, something in his hand. He's watching the smoke to see which way the air is going. This is one of my favorite machines. This is a great big hoist and it's run by a water wheel. And of course a hoist you don't want running continuously. Um, you just want it to raise sometimes, lower sometimes. The man in this balcony here has a couple levers. Um, if we want to raise something up out of the shaft, then you pull the lever that lets the water flow onto this side of the water wheel and it turns in the clockwise direction as we're facing it. You want to lower something down, you let that lever up, you pull the other lever and it puts water on the other side of the wheel, it turns counterclockwise and lowers it. Where this guy's going, I have no idea. Looks like he's going straight up into the sky. And in this diagram, uh, we got water wheels running stamp mills and they've worked out a way to use the same water twice. It first turns these upper wheels, which run the first two banks of stamps, and the same water runs, turns the lower water wheels, which run the second bank of stamps. And guy down here is making or repairing stamps, a set of st a stamp for the mill. There are lots of different kinds of furnaces uh, for all different purposes, for calcining the ore to um, oxidize it, make it brittle, make it suitable for processing, for smelting, which is the process of extracting the raw metal from the rock, for refining, for purifying and separating you know, the different metals and so on. There are all different kinds of furnaces for those purposes. For uh, purifying lead, these are crudely smelted cakes of lead and they're being remelted and put into a more usable form for further processing. What interests me about this one, um, my interest in, I'm, I'm an old math teacher among other things, um, is these um, notations of weight on the, on the cakes of lead. I do not know how to interpret those, but that must have been the system of notation that was used at that time. The Hindu Arabic numerals were not well known in Europe yet at this time. Most of Agricola's illustrations still use Roman numerals, especially for the more mundane uh, purposes. Some of the scientific instruments show Hindu Arabic numerals on that he illustrates, but mostly it's Roman numerals or antique, nowadays unknown notations like that that are used. History, history of numeration is another whole fascinating subject that fortunately we don't have time to get into here today. Georgius Agricola would feel very much at home at the Saugus National Historic Site, Saugus, Massachusetts. It's just kind of on the north edge of the Boston area. This was, it's a reconstruction of the first integrated iron making facility in the New World. Um, here they uh, got bog iron from some deposits in the area, brought it in here, crushed it, smelted it, um, and made it into made it made it into cast iron. Uh, they also made you know, strap iron for making nails and things like that here. But the technology here is right straight out of Dere Metallica. In fact, they sell the book at the bookstore the park. But Agricola would feel very much at home in here. This was. This place was originally was built less than 100 years after he died, so right in his time era. One question about the book that I haven't been able to answer is how much did it cost? Um, everybody routinely describes the book as costly, which is I mean, obviously it was. It's not a cheap thing to produce a book like this at any point in history, let alone in the 1500s. But I've searched and searched and searched, and so far have not found any direct record of what somebody paid for a first edition copy of Dere Metallica. Um, there, I did, someone did dig up for me a reference in passing somewhere that the, the 1560 Italian edition sold somewhere for one and one half golden. 
translating currencies from 500 years ago to, de- to today is nigh unto impossible. But um, we can use the principle of equal work. It's a long story how we know this, but Agricola's publisher, Froben, paid his press men, press operators, about one to one and a half golden a week. So if we look today at what a printing press operator makes today, it's in the vicinity of $600 a week, you know, give or take quite a bit. But a week's pay for a printer is a lot to pay for a book, 600 bucks. So it's no wonder that towns would chain their copy of the book to the elder in the church to keep it from wandering off somewhere. Georgius Agricola did all this work more or less in his spare time because after all, he was a practicing physician and a family man and also had some civic responsibilities. He had earned the respect of his fellow citizens. He was erected a, a burger, excuse me, elected a burger or a city councilor in Chemnitz um, several times. And he also had the confidence of the prince who appointed him burgomaster or mayor for terms as mayor of Chemnitz. Um, but one thing, one other thing that was going on during his lifetime is that Martin Luther was born just 10 years before Georgius Agricola, and he lived just up the road. So the Protestant Reformation was going full blast um, right in Agricola's backyard during his lifetime. When he died, he, as a leading citizen of Chemnitz, he would have been entitled to burial in the church. However, he had remained a staunch Roman Catholic um, throughout his life, and the Protestant prince of the district refused to allow him to be buried in the church. So friends had to arrange for his remains to be taken to the nearby town of of Zeitz, which was a more securely Catholic community, and he's buried in the church. That's that's where his bones lie to this day. So Georgius Agricola made significant and original contributions to technology through De Re Metallica and his other publications. And he made contributions to science in general by kind of pioneering the emphasis on empirical investigation as opposed to just philosophical speculation to establish the facts of science. The architect Christopher Wren, who designed St. Paul's Cathedral in London, is a famous epitaph on his tomb down in the crypt in St. Paul's. It says, if you seek a monument, look around you. Well, Agricola can kind of say the same sort of thing. Because a lot of people have published books over the years, but how many of them are in print 450 years later? So, thank you very much. Dankeschön und Glück auf. And that's what I have for you today. That was a really great presentation about a very interesting person that I didn't really know about. Um, So thank you for that. Um, If anyone has any questions, you can unmute yourself and ask or type it in chat. But if not, I'll end this in a couple of minutes. And again, thank you for coming out and giving this presentation today, Ed. It was great. Well, it's my, it's my pleasure. I obviously am kind of fascinated with the guy and I'm pleased to, to share what I've learned about him. Um, to complete the list about the important books from the time, I think it's important to mention the Schwarzer Bergbuch, the mining book of Schwarz in Austria, which was more about uh, the mining law. It was um, Mm. in 1556 um, in the house of Habsburg. To come to the list. I wasn't aware of that one, but um, I'm pleased to know about it. I'm I'm sure there's a copy of it in in the Hoover's reference library. Uh, in Germany, the German Mining Museum has an edition uh, with three books. It is um, one is a facsimile, a copy. The second is a translated text in modern Germany, and the third is a historical review. It is um, not about uh, the um, a teaching book about mining. It wo- is more about mining law, but mm-hmm. uh, to um, tell the people about um, 
which are making the law to tell about the mining, it's um, many descriptional texts. Mm -hmm. There, there is, um, I think it's the second chapter in De Re Metallica is largely about mining law, how claims are established and um, how royalties are distributed from the proceeds of mining and, and all that. So I think I would not be surprised if, if the Hoovers had consulted the book you're describing in helping explain that, yeah, that but chapter. It, but it was not so widespread, the mining book of Schwarz, because there were, were only a few um, exemplars of it, hmm. because it was, I have read about five to 10 exemplars in this time. It was only for one meeting in Schwarz where the mining law should be renewed. Well, thanks. Thanks for mentioning that. I'll I'll add that to my list of. Okay. Thanks resources. for the lesson. Was my German okay earlier? Yes, it was okay. I think uh, you here said I'm from Germany. Yeah, I'm, I'm guess I'm guessing. I, I guess. <laughs> okay. Yet it was, yes, it was uh, understandable. So passable okay. anyway. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the connection to Hoover. That was very interesting. Yeah, that's a um, that's how I first learned of the book. Um, I lived for Herbert Hoover was born in the town of West Branch, Iowa, and I lived in or near West Branch for many years. And during college, um, see Herbert Hoover's father was a blacksmith. And that gives the U.S. National Park Service an excuse to run a blacksmith shop at Herbert Hoover's birthplace. So I did a living history blacksmithing at Herbert Hoover National Historic Site for two summers. Oh, and Hoover's presidential library is also there. And it was you know, touring that library where I first learned of Dere Metallica and um, bought a copy of it, bought a copy of their edition and so on. So that's that's how I was first introduced was through the Hoover connection. Hmm. My grandfather was a lifelong friend of Hoover's. He was, uh, they met through mining and uh, grandfather hmm. invested in some of his, or Hoover, Hoover invested in some of my grandfather's mines. Hmm. Now the, the whole story of kind of what it took to get it translated and so forth was a, an interesting thing. It came, got that partly from uh, Hoover's official biography uh, mm -hmm. by uh, George Nash, who wrote a big three volume book. And there, there's some, some useful information about the translation project that I learned from that, from that biography. Oh, okay. I'll end it now and thank you, Ed. Hey, have thanks. Good good the, uh, you. Alex has my email address if anybody has yep. you know, further questions or communications or know anybody else who'd be interested in in hearing about the Grecola, then um, have, have slides and we'll travel. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.